Hey, my name is Neil Parfit. This is a 2019 Mac Pro buyer's guide for people mainly in audio and music production. You could go find all this information on a forum somewhere, but honestly, what's more de facto than a middle-aged overweight guy with a bad cat shirt? Choose wisely. I also made this video because these are questions I get asked a lot through professional contacts and through YouTube and email and all that stuff. So I decided I'd just consolidate what I share with people and use it to your advantage. So let's dive into it. I'm gonna cover CPU, memory, graphics, SSDs, all the factors you need to think about when you're buying a machine. So let's dive in. So it's that moment of truth. So like most with the Mac Pro, we just kept waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. It was almost seven years, and finally Apple decided to do something. I don't know why it took so long, but here we are. So if you were like me or many other music professionals, you're rocking a four comma one or five comma one tower. You've done everything you can to keep that machine running. You've updated the processors. You've gone over memory spec to 128 gigs. On the trash can, you've updated the processors. You tried putting in more RAM, but there's a memory bus speed compromise when you go over 64 gigs. There was Thunderbolt bandwidth issues and so on and so on. So when this machine came out, you were finally like, all right, I need to buy one of these things and it's shiny. I can grate food with it. Here we are. But which machine do you get for music and audio work? So let's take a look at our options. I'll leave the form factor to you. I chose the rack for my specific needs, but the tower and the rack are no different technically. Um, just be aware that if you do decide to get the rack, there are considerations because the rack rails are 24 inch post to post and a lot of AV gear and desks and furniture is not. So you'd have to come up with some additional accommodations and modifications to make that fit in your rack unless you just put some felt feet on it and just slide it on your bottom shelf. So you can do that too, just be aware that it is pretty deep. But for most people, the tower is easier to manage and carry and all those things, and it just makes more sense. So let's just focus on the tower. So here we go. And just as a heads up, this is in Canadian dollars, so the prices are a lot lower if you're looking at it in US dollars, but the information about the tech is the same. So let's take a look. So here's where it gets very gray on the music and audio side of things. You have a whole bunch of DSP processing that requires a lot of math. And because that math is in real time, like if you're recording a band or you're mixing, you wanna hear these results instantly. It's not like video where you can use proxy files and stuff like that especially virtual instruments, it needs to do the math pretty much instantly so you can hear what you're doing in real time. If I'm playing a virtual piano or an instrument or adding a process to a vocalist or something, like it's all real time. So all that math requires some CPU muscle and that's where you want the high CPU clock. So at first glance, the 3.5 gigahertz looks really good. But here's where it gets kind of confusing. Audio software, because there's so many tracks of different processes going on, you need threads. And the problem is, the higher your thread count, the lower your clock frequency becomes. So if we scroll down and look at our options, we have a 3.58 core, 3.312 core, 3.216 core, and down the clock frequency goes, up the core count goes, up until the 2.5 gigahertz, 28 core. And you can see that the price starts to exponentially jump the more cores you get and your wallet's gonna take a grading. So the idea with buying an Apple machine is you don't want this to last you for two years. Like these are like five year machines, eight year machines. So you sort of wanna buy kind of planning ahead for the future. So you'll have this machine for a long time and you can grow with it. So that's what we wanna find. We wanna find the best value for the dollar and performance. And that's where your clock frequency and your number of threads sort of intersect with getting your money's worth out of the machine and not overspending for something that underperforms. So let's take a look at this. So our reference computers are gonna be this. Uh, one will be the 12 core 3.46 five comma one tower, which is actually two separate six core chips. And actually Apple never made that machine. That was uh, CPU upgrades users did later. It was the fastest chip you could use with that chipset and it ended up working. So a lot of people have used that as their last leg on the towers. 
Secondly, we'll use the Mac Pro 6,1 trash can with the 2.7 12 core because that machine's also been out in the wild for almost seven years. So between those two machines, anybody out there doing this stuff professionally, chances are you have one of those machines at least or a variant of it. So we know how those perform in the wild. We know what to expect and we can compare this to those. I think you'll be able to relate to these specs and it will make sense. So let's look at these numbers here. So these are figures I pulled from Geekbench. This isn't exacto science, it's just they ran benchmarks and these are the numbers they coughed up, but it will give us a good indicator of how much faster the new machine is versus the old systems. So if you look, 2013 6,1 machine, the 12 core, scores 7,047. So that's our baseline for power in a multi-core situation, running virtual instruments and stuff like that. So. Where do all these machines stack up? So check it out. The entry-level Mac Pro, seven years later almost, 7,047, 7,998. <laughs> That's not a drastic jump. Like when you start looking at the 12 core, it's almost at 12,000. And the 28 core is at almost 20,000. So the value here doesn't stack up. I'm just going to plot a little thing here just so you can really see how this makes no sense. So let's look at this using some high school cross multiplication. So I'm going to make one thing here called the juice and we'll do another one called Geekbench Mac Pro 6 comma 1. And this will be the fastest one you could get in 2013. So this one scored 7047. We're going to treat that as our baseline. So that's our 100%. Now, let's look at the baseline offering of the Mac Pro. So that score is 7998. So we'll do some cross multiplication. This times this, and then we'll divide it by this. We'll give it uh, two decimal places, why not? So just from a math perspective, let's look at this. Without any of these additional options, the baseline machine, which is $6,000 Canadian, is only 13% faster than what we had seven years ago. So that, just by the numbers is a terrible value. 6,000 bucks to get 13% more than what you had. Ridiculous. So let's go up the line here. The next one here is the 12 core, it scores 11,841. Okay, so check this out. 12 core, you're getting 68% more power than what you had before. So you're getting your machine and two thirds almost in processing performance. Now keep in mind, I'm not talking about the night and day jump in disk throughput, uh, memory capacity and performance and stuff like that. This is just CPU power. So let's jump up even more. $1,000 more, so now we're at $8,000. This machine scores 14,523. Look at that. So plugging in the 16 core, we're 106% faster than our original machine from seven years ago. And this is where stuff starts to make sense in my brain. It's basically two times more capable of what you had CPU wise from seven years ago. Now, if you look at those differences, jumping from the base model to the 16 core for two grand, it's $8,000 Canadian, but it's double what I had before versus this one that is barely a fart in the wind and is still $6,000. So you can see how these two machines are really not a good value. Now, in those situations where you're running a ton of threads and you need a ton of juice, let's just step up a notch. The 24 core scores 17,326. So let's look at that. So if you needed a ton of power, the 24 core is like having two and a half of your old machines all under one hood. And finally, if we look at their maximum offering as of September 2020, and honestly, this is probably the final offering because it's old CPU architecture already. This one scores 19,226. So this one's like 2.7 of the maxed out machines from seven years ago. You notice when we jump up to the 24 core, the clock jumps down, price jumps way up, and we're getting like two and a half almost machines of what we're used to. And then finally, 28 core, it's 2.7 machines of what we were used to. My takeaway from this whole thing is the machine to get, if you're gonna do this, is the middle offering, the 16 core. We're still at a good CPU clock here. You're above three gigahertz, you have 32 threads in total with the hyper threading, and it's basically two of the machines that you had of what you're used to. It's expensive, I know, but honestly, 
if you're not looking at this machine, I wouldn't even do it. I'd research maybe the iMacs or like the fully decked out MacBook Pros, but the machines before it aren't good values for what you get. I mean, 14% more than what you had before seven years ago for $7,500. It's just not a good machine for the money. So with that in mind, I'm gonna keep the 16 core as our option here and move forward with that. All right, so let's move on to memory. And man, look at these prices. How much memory is right for you? None of it from the Apple store is my recommendation. The pricing is absolutely outrageous. Honestly, these prices right here are for institutions like universities and colleges that need to burn through their budget so they get the same amount of money next year. No end user should have to pay these prices and you absolutely should not, especially on a machine like this where you can change the RAM out after the fact. I have 384 gigs of RAM on my machine. Here, $7,500. Uh, third party through a company like Newegg, uh, using a brand such as Nemix, they're charging $1,852 for 256 gigs of RAM. If we bought six 64 gig modules, that would come to $2,778 versus $7,500. It is absolutely a shocking difference in money. There is also OWC memory as well. So an example kit from OWC, this is US dollar now. They're asking $2,530 US for 384 gigs of RAM. So same thing, 64 gig modules. I mean, what are you gonna pick? This or dropping $7,500? The answer is pretty clear. One important thing is the 32 gigs of RAM here, you're basically gonna take that out and just put it on a shelf. Any of these module options here that are in 64 gig chunks, 32 gig chunks, you wanna run those all the same capacity modules. You can't mix and match properly and triple channel runs best when these are all the same capacity. So that's what you wanna do. Also, don't get these eight gig modules or 16 gig modules. Like make sure they're 64 or 32 because that way there's so many slots in the machine. You can just add more sticks of RAM later when memory drops instead of having to pull out all these junker modules. You're just throwing money away that way. So aim for 32 gig modules or 64 gig modules. And remember that Mac Pro has 12 memory slots. So regardless, you're laughing with memory capacity. All right, what's next? We got graphics. So this is always a funny thing to look at on YouTube because all the influencers are slamming this thing for graphic performance. But the good thing for us is none of this crap matters. For us, we just need to see our DAW on the screen and that's it. So this base model is fully adequate. You don't need to upgrade your card. The base model, has two HDMI ports on the back. I'm running two 4K displays at 60 Hertz, and I have a third 4K display running on a DisplayPort connector from a Thunderbolt dock. So this is more than adequate. Everything I have is smooth as butter, no graphic performance issues, and it only takes a single PCIe slot. When you start upgrading into these cards here, they take a significant amount of space because they have such massive heat sinks on them. The only added benefit of these cards from just a functionality perspective for us is it does have four additional Thunderbolt 3 ports on the back of it if you don't have a hub or something like that. So it could be useful, but if you're planning to cram your machine full of PCIe cards, like a bunch of HDX cards and UAD and all those things, this is gonna eat up a significant amount of space because it's gonna cover up multiple slots. So just be warned that this might not be the best value for you. Okay, so storage. It's 2020 and the base level option is 256 gigs. Are you kidding me? That is just a joke, honestly. I'd say if you can spend the money and at least get one terabyte minimum, I don't keep any of my client work or samples on my system drive. It's literally just the applications, the operating system, and I just have a shared Dropbox with general documents that I need to reference. So one terabyte is more than enough and there's enough breathing room for years to come. So I wouldn't get anything bigger than one terabyte, honestly, because for any of that large capacity stuff, you can use third party drives. And just as a footnote, these are Apple proprietary SSDs. The T2 chip is the drive controller. So you can't just pull this chip out and pop in a third party M2. It doesn't work that way. So that's why just use this for a system drive and that's it. Everything else buy third party. So I'll pick one terabyte and let's keep going. Afterburner, don't need it. 
<laughs> feet are wheels. Uh, do you need wheels for your Mac Pro? Absolutely not. If you really need wheels that badly, go to Home Depot or Lowe's and get like a little board for $5 and screw on some uh, $10 casters. There you go. I've saved you $480. So yeah, I <laughs> the wheels are absolutely ridiculous. If you're going to spend $500, spend $500, you know, here, get a two terabyte or something like don't buy with the wheels. Magic Mouse or trackpad. I actually don't like either of them. So I just use the default because I just put it in a box as soon as I got it. Keyboard, standard keyboard. Pre-installed software, if you own these already, you don't have to buy them again. You just synchronize your Apple ID. The next time you log into the App Store, you'll have it. So don't need to tack that on. So, so far with just these options, we're at $10,500 Canadian. Let's hit continue. Pro Display XDR. Honestly, it looks amazing, but does it matter for audio or music production? Absolutely not. I'd just say no thanks and uh, get a third party display. I just bought a 30 inch LG 4K display and it was around $480 Canadian. There are USB-C variants of it, but I'm not gonna pay an extra $500 just for the sake of a connector type. They look exactly the same and it just gives me more money for other things like RAM and hard drives and stuff like that. So let's keep going. Pro stand, <laughs> $12.99, oh my God. All right, so add to bag. If you're spending this much money, Get the Apple Care. It expends the warranty up to three years. And if you're spending this much money, I'd rather have a three year warranty than a one year warranty. So I do it. One thing I should mention though is unless they've changed their policies, you'd have to check, but you don't have to buy Apple Care Plus on purchase. It just has to be any time within the first year. So if you're a little bit short of funds, you can wait and then like five months from now or whatever, just don't forget to buy it. Let's see where we're at now. Anybody running some older Thunderbolt 2 stuff, you may need some of these dongles. That's fine. They work really well. I haven't had any issues with them. CalDigit also has an active Thunderbolt 3 cable that's two meters. This actually might be it. I like the idea of this Pegasus, but it's really expensive for what it is. I mean, it's an eight terabyte SATA drive and like a metal bracket thing, and it's $520. So, so I didn't buy that. I mean, I didn't feel like it was good value. I have enough external enclosures. And if I'm going to use an older hard drive, it's going to be for some storage. So I don't care if it's a little bit slower. So this for me was unnecessary. Actually, this is pretty important. If you're running HDX cards, make sure you get this because you may need this and a few adapters to power your cards. So I'm actually really annoyed that Apple doesn't include this. They changed the header type from world standard to small and they don't include the cables like this should be an automatic included thing, but it's not. Just don't forget to buy it if you need this kind of power. All right, let's review the bag. Whew. All right, let's look at this wallet shredder. It's not a cheese shredder, it's a wallet shredder. Let's see what we have. We have the 16 core Xeon at 3.2 gigahertz. We have the stock RAM, 32 gigs. Don't care about that because we're gonna replace it. And stock video, one terabyte system, mouse and keyboard, and Apple Care. So, you know, it's a big chunk of money, but again, if you plan to be using this machine for, you know, three to seven years, it's sort of worth it in the long run if you're making money with it. It's typical Apple tax stuff, but uh, if you're trapped in this environment, it is what it is. I'm not getting into the Mac versus PC stuff right now. We're just talking about this and this is what we have. So here we are. Um, I am going to get out of this page because I don't want to accidentally buy another one. Let's talk about the last few things we need to make this a good audio workstation. We need hard drives. So let's talk about SSDs. I've always leaned towards the Samsung Evo series. In this machine, I have four of the Samsung 970 Evo Pluses, and uh, they're great. I have them rated together into a single volume and a RAID 0, and it's smoking fast, so no complaints. I've also been looking at this company called Sabrent. I think that's how you say it. I bought one of these in late June, and just as a test and it's smoking fast and they're priced aggressively versus Samsung. And I think that's their 
aim, I guess. But uh, high capacities, like four terabytes for 900 Canadian at that kind of PCI Express performance, it's awesome. And they have an eight terabyte version now, which I'm looking at. And again, it's priced aggressively because before the only one I could see was like a 7.6 terabyte Samsung that was like this impossible to find server variant. And uh, the eight terabyte version of this thing is like a standard M2 size. So I'm going to keep an eye on it. But other than that, I don't have any reliability specs because I haven't been using it long enough, whereas the Samsungs have been sort of an old faithful technology for like the last seven, eight years of SSD tech. So take a look at both. They both have great reviews and just make a decision. Regardless of what you choose, just make sure you have a backup strategy, especially if you're rating any of these together, because again, multiple points of failure, you'll lose everything if it's a RAID 0. So speaking of these SSDs, the Mac Pro does not have internal M.2 connectors. So we do need something to plug these into. And let me show you those now. So I'm using this card on my machine. It's an Amphiltech Squid Carrier Board. I can put six M.2 SSDs in a single PCIe slot. So it's great. And performance wise, it's fantastic. No complaints especially in load time when you're loading up big sample sets. I will note though that uh, Contact doesn't make full use of that pipeline. The fastest I've seen it go is about one and a half gigs a second. But again, it's night and day. I can fit six drives on a single card and there's less stuff on the outside I have to worry about. So it just keeps it nice and clean. The only thing I did have to do with this card is take off the fans because they're pretty loud, but I haven't had any heating issues. So keep that as a consideration if you're gonna use one of these things. I was happy to support Ampletech. They're a Canadian company. They make these literally 20 minutes away from where I live and yeah, go Canada. Oh, that's so cheesy. So if you don't need six of those SSDs and you only need four or two or something like that, check out Sonnet. They have a card here that lets you put up to four of those M.2s on a PCIe card. And Sonnet's fantastic. If you've been in the Mac game for a long time, Sonic's always been around with these kind of cards and processor upgrades and all sorts of things going way back. So they're a solid company. And as far as I know, this fan only ramps up if there's a severe heating issue. But thankfully the Mac Pro has such good airflow. I see that as a non-issue. So there may be a lot of you out there who've invested a ton of money in the 2.5 inch SATA 3 slash 6 gig uh, SSDs over the years, like the Samsung Evos and stuff like that. So if you have all that stuff already, don't toss it. I mean, instead of buying all new SSDs, migrate them over. Sonnet has this card here and then pop this card to the machine and you're up and running. And the great thing is, unlike before, if you were running these in a Mac Pro tower, these were only ever running at half speed because those SATA ports are only SATA 2. So the moment you pop this on a card like this, you're gonna get double the performance that you had before for spending you know, a few hundred dollars on this card. And you can use all your existing drives. It's a good option. And because the Mac Pro has so many PCIe slots, you can get multiples of these cards and have like four drives or six drives all on the machine if you need it. So another thing to consider. The second last thing I wanted to touch upon fairly quickly is I've had a lot of people ask me if they should buy a base level machine and upgrade the processor themselves. I'm all for it a few years down the line when you can get a 28 core chip for, you know, $500. But as of now, the Intel server chips are still really expensive. And I do know some people who've tried it and almost bricked their machines. So it's still not a cut and dry, easy thing to do like the old 5,1 and 6,1 machines. So. That and also you're spending a ton of money and then immediately breaking the warranty. So that's also not too ideal because if they really wanted to check, they'd totally know because machines applied their thermal paste and compounds. That wasn't a human doing it. So they'll be fully aware if someone's gone in and changed the chip themselves and there's been a problem. Like they could totally say no if they wanted to. And with the amount of money I spent, it wasn't worth taking that risk. As it is now, I have the machine I needed and there's three years of warranty. So maybe I'll investigate this once my warranty period has expired. So. Until then, I'll just use what I have. Also, I think there were some Xeon chips in that series that didn't have enough PCI Express lanes, so it's not a really quick and dirty answer kind of thing. And again, blowing a warranty 
for some savings might end up biting you later if something actually goes wrong and they decide to call you on your own upgrade. So yeah. All right, so last but not least, I just wanted to bring up the keyboard because when the Mac Pro came out, I was actually pretty critical about it coming with a Bluetooth keyboard because if you're at a workstation, your keyboard's on your desk. So it just ends up being another peripheral you have to remember to charge, which is kind of annoying. And yes, you can use the lightning cable, but then it was just this black cable jutting out the back, whereas the previous gen, the cable was hidden underneath, so it was just a cleaner look. So this right here is this. It's a Matthias wired aluminum keyboard. And the cool thing about it is a, it feels great. B, there's no wires jutting directly out of the back. It kind of comes out the side and I can tuck it nicely along the side. So it's a cleaner look. And also it has backlighting. So it's like my MacBook Pro. So I can hold down backlight, turn up the plus button and check that out. Now it, it's even better than what I had and there's no wires to be seen. And if I don't like the white, there's a dial on the back and I can dial it in. You're not gonna be able to see it too easily here, but it goes through the entire RGB spectrum. So you can just sort of dial in the color you like. And then I think there's three levels of brightness of the backlight with uh, pressing the minus and the plus buttons. So I'm really happy about this. It solved all my issues. The only thing I need to do now is just Velcro it to my desk and then it's like locked into place and it's just a permanent part of my desk. So really happy about that. And the biggest thing I'm stoked about is one, it's a Canadian company and two, it was designed and their home offices are in my hometown of Aurora, Ontario. So how cool was that? I had no idea. And uh, no, this is not a sponsored placement. I paid for this keyboard with my own money. And uh, I just wanted to give them a shout out because I was so excited. And uh, it solved all my problems. And they also have a smaller variant without the number pad if you don't want it. But I chose to get the number pad because a lot of Pro Tools work. You want that number pad right there. So and with that, it takes us to our conclusion. So there you have it. Hopefully this helps you with making a more informed decision when you're purchasing a machine. And uh, happy music making. Okay, bye.